Zoom. Okay, so we are. We're recording now. Okay. So welcome everybody to the Brush O Fun meet and greet. Thank you. Mm -hmm. yeah, it's good to see you, Edith. I'm glad that you showed up because you know you were the one who made the request for doing well, the, the, the artist talk. So we're glad that you're here to help with the talk. <laughs> so I am. Um, I am by no means a professional or a historian um, of anything, never mind even art history. So all of my information has come from what I researched just this past week. I don't have any um, previous knowledge or anything. So if you have questions about anything that's in here, I can't answer them because this is all I know right here. <laughs> so, um, yeah, he is a very interesting man, that's for sure. Um, I know it was a part of the culture of the time um, to be living the life that he led. I know that a lot of artists live that way too. Um, and I will keep my commentary to myself about some of the, the opinions that I formed. Um, so <laughs> some of them are positive and some of them are negative, but either way, they're just opinions and they don't really matter to what I'm going to be talking about. Um, the facts of his life are he was born with a really long name and I can't pronounce most of it, but he had about 10 names. And uh, what he ended up going by from, um, from as an artist's point of view, he was born in 1881 to Don Jose Ruiz y Blanco and Maria Picasso in Malaysia, Spain. And as an artist, he went by Pablo Ruiz Picasso. His dad was um, a known artist and well-respected in his time. He was a teacher at a museum and he was also the curator and he taught drawing. Um, so he chose to teach Pablo at a very young age, um, all of the skills of art. And by the time he was 10 years old, he was actually exceeding his dad uh, with his skills, which actually discouraged his dad a lot. And he ended up um, backing away from art, but he wanted to support his son. So at the age of 13, Picasso was enrolled in the School of Fine Arts in Barcelona, and he was classically trained in both portraits and still life. Some of his inspiration from other artists was Rembrandt, El Greco, Goya, and Velasquez. And he actually painted some of their works. He, he did recreations of what he had already seen, but he made them modern for his time. Um, when he did that, he wanted to document the march of time um, and see the differences in the world culturally. But he also um, had a very strong kind of almost like a, a, a rebellion against art was always showing um, the beauty and the wealth and everything was staged. So a portrait was staged to show the prominence of people and the still lifes were actually like to show the wealth of banquets or to show the wealth of merchants. And he kind of wanted to show the other side of the world. And he wanted to show poverty and he wanted to show raw, real, dirty life. And so when he made these paintings from these um, masters before him, he kind of made them a little more scandalous and a little more edgy. And his work was actually classified as um, scandalous. And that was a name that stuck with him throughout his whole career. Every time that he made a march forward with his art, he would push the boundaries, he would push the edges, he would make statements that had actually never been said before. And they just kept dubbing him as scandalous. 
Um, so he was doing that when he was between the ages of 14 and 17. And at the age of 17, his family moved to Madrid where he could attend uh, the finest academy in Spain, which was called the Real Academia de Bellas Arts de San Ferdinando, Fernando, um, which sounds to me like they're saying the Real Academy of Beautiful Arts in San Fernando. Um, Royal Academy. Skills... Go ahead. Well, Real is royal, isn't it? Oh, royal. yeah. Oh, okay, Real, okay. Um, so while he was in this institution, his skills were still growing and he was learning from them, but he felt the, the need stronger to paint things um, that weren't, that were hidden. He wanted to show the reality of the world around him. And I kind of um, talked about all that already. So the criticisms of his work caused him to call out the academy. And he was saying that it was unwilling to advance in his art and it was stifling and suppressive. And it was no longer useful to him because he felt that he had learned all that he could learn from them. And at the same time as this, he had faced some illness in his life that he almost died from. Those two events, along with the dreams of an adventurous schoolmate named Carlos Cas... Cas I can't say it. I practiced it and now I can't say it. Casagemus. Anyways, the two of them left Spain and went to France. This was a source of contention for him and his dad. He was disowned. He was not financially supported. And at that point, he took Ruiz out of his name. And from then on, he only signed his artwork as Pablo Picasso. So there was a complete break from his family when he went to France. Um, these two men experienced direct abject poverty. And at some points they even had to burn their own paintings to keep from freezing. Wow. Picasso couldn't, sorry, you said something Edith? No, I'm just saying, wow, you know. Oh, <laughs> surprise to burn in the paintings. Yeah. I actually heard of some people doing that in Texas about three weeks ago, unfortunately. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. it came close to that. <laughs> yeah. um, some did. I, I heard a direct experience. Anyways, um, Picasso couldn't endure this for very long. And it was about three to five months in that he returned to Barcelona and he chose to get a job as an illustrator for a magazine that was called Young Art. And at that time he was able to expose and discuss poverty through this media experience. Um, during that time, he learned that Casagemus had, um, he knew he was depressed before he left and he had fallen into alcoholism, but um, his spiral downwards continued and he ended up attempting to murder his girlfriend and committed suicide. Uh, this was something that really struck Picasso hard. Um, it's believed that he blamed himself for these events because he left his friend and kind of abandoned him and he felt like if he would have stayed, maybe it wouldn't have happened. Um, so that is one of the two factors that created what is called Picasso's blue period. Um, it was blue because it was all of his emotions, all of his distress, all of his, um, he was broken from the poverty. He was broken from his own ties with his family being broken. Um, he was broken with the guilt of losing his best friend in such a horrific manner. But it was also called the blue period because when he was in Spain, most of the colors and the pigments that they used were earth tones and they were local to the area and they were very natural looking um, pigments. When he went to France, he was introduced to bright colors and the reds and the blues were in his life for the very first time. So he had a fascination with these colors because they were new to him. And some of the work that he did was really just um, to experiment with that color. And they were somewhat monochromatic um, just because he wanted to play with blue. So it was a blue period because those pictures were very depressing. And it was a blue period because it was literally blue. 
for the first time for him. Um, during that blue period, he had actually painted multiple times what he imagined the murder suicide scene to look like. And he painted the funeral of his friend more than once. Um, so it was very, very dark, um, disruptive paintings that he was painting. Um, sorry, I'm saying um too much. No, it's interesting. Go on. So also, while he, um, he went back to France after he found out that Carlos had died and he was determined to make it work, but he was still impoverished. And so in a way to save money, because these models wouldn't charge for a fee, and it was also um, along the lines of his idealism of painting the raw real world, he actually went to the women's prison and he painted from life from these women. Um, so this was also, uh, lost my spot here. Okay, uh, at that time, the women were able to have their children with them or the, if they were pregnant, there was like, the, there was just um, children around and maternity was like everywhere, but it was again, still that impoverished state and where maternity was always either the mother Mary or very um, regal and noble and majestic. He focused on maternity from a very real point of view. He showed these women just kind of, they, they, it was still loving, but it was just raw. And he, he uh, stripped away the glamor and he wanted to show life as it was. And he, he went through pregnancy, he went through nursing, he went through toddlers running around and that was a full stage that kind of transferred. It was part blue and it also went into what was called the rose period, which followed the blue period. Um, this was again, a new and exciting color for him, but his mental health was in a better place. He had his first mistress then, he had a job and he was in a much happier state of mind. Um, so this is actually where his, uh, his work titled The Boy with Pipe came from this period and it's to date his best-selling piece of work. So that came from the Rose period. Uh, and this is where he really began to change the art world with his own influence. Um, no longer bound to classical ties and still curious about what was out there. He learned of an African style of painting and he was influenced by that. This was also very contra controversial to a lot of people, partly because of the abstract nature, but also because of the aggressive feelings and the mix of classical form with broken line and discord. So he was true to the classics, but he was putting this edge on it and he was making something that was never seen before, but he was still painting women and there was still a, a for it almost felt violent with all of the harsh angles and everything that he did. And so that was the second time in his life that his work was called Scandalous. So mm -hmm. this African influence led to primitivism, which brought him notoriety and controversy um, because once again, his models were prostitutes and brothels. And he just really wanted to show the other side of life. He was disillusioned with wealth and with this, I think of it almost like selfies where people just want to have, you know, I'm taking this picture and everything in life is great. And who cares if something's burning over there? Life is great in this image. And it's a false image. Like, and he, he's just calling out false images with everything that he does. He's just really trying to say the world is not like that. This is real. And he was angry about it, but he was also wanting to draw attention to the injustices in the world. Um, so that was part of the motivation behind everything that he did. But the stretch of his artistic style opened doors to creativity that was still to come and for people to partner with. Enter Cubism. From 1902 to 1912, Picasso partnered with George Brock and they were classified now as the fathers of analytical cubism. 
So this is where they would deconstruct basic forms of a person or an object. And these forms were actually true to what was seen if you were to do classical, but they would put them, they would obscure them. And we've all seen his work where, you know, the eyes are over here and this is over there. Well, it's actually true to form, but it's just put in the wrong place. So he was messing with the art world again. Um, it was fully correct and fully wrong. That's everything about his work right there. Um, during this cubism period, he was with his second mistress. Her name was Fernandez Olivier, and she was his muse and she was his model. And I believe she was the first mother of his kids. I think I lost that on my notes, but I'm pretty sure that that's where his first child came from. Um, analytical cubism led to synthetic cubism. And this is where um, most of the people in our world may or may not know this, but this is where mixed media came from. He was the very first person to take found objects and adhere them to a painting. So he was using cigar papers and he was using other little tidbits that he, because he wanted more depth and he wanted more shape and more structure. And so he was actually the very first person to do something like that. Um, so we have him to thank for anything that we stick and glue on our paintings. <laughs> um, this was also groundbreaking and it took a long time for people to actually stop shunning him for doing it. It was kind of, they didn't use the word scandalous but they weren't approving of him putting stuff in the painting. It wasn't classical and it wasn't right. Um, so yeah, he just had to keep messing with them as much as he could. Uh, we're also getting into the point of time where World War I happened. And in 1915, he took a little bit of a break from painting for a little while. And he went into the world of theater. There was a, um, where is his name? I lost a page. There was a, a, he was a stage writer named Eric Satie, and he had written a play called La Parade, and it was an extreme uh, story about war. They were anti-war, um, but the thing about it was the settings were the first time where in a stage production, up until that point, it had always been nature scenes. There was only trees and rocks and skies for backgrounds, but he painted a background that had uh, sky, skyscrapers because they were new and airplanes because they were also new, but the costumes that were created for this play were based on cubism. And so the clothing actually was dimensional and had the weird shapes and had the weird obscure looks. So the clothing was influenced by the works of Picasso and uh, he changed fashion as well as art with, with his work. Who knew that was gonna happen, right? Uh, while he was doing this production, he met uh, his wife. She was a dancer. She was part of the performance and Oh, that would have been his first child. Yeah, okay, so he had his first child with her. Um, but he didn't like her lifestyle. She was an outgoing person. She was social. She was part of the, um, the fast scene as being like a celebrity of the time. And he didn't like that. So he never divorced her, but he had a, a mistress on the side. And he, he was faithful to her and their son as far as like taking care of them financially until she passed away. But he just carried on with his own life and uh, just went to the next woman. But this one happened to only be 17 years old and the mother of his second child. This woman's influence 
on his art took him into the next set of art that he is the founder of called neoclassicism and surrealism. So uh, this was an era of paintings where he started depicting uh, mythical creatures like centaurs and nymphs and erotica. And this kind of left cubism behind and he was actually painting a little bit more into the classical style, but with mythical subjects that came from imagination. And he depicted all kinds of things in, these, in this period that uh, put him in the negative critical light. Um, they didn't like what he was doing. It was again, scandalous work. And again, he's pushing the envelope doing things that hadn't actually been done before. So now we're at World War II. And while he was in Paris, it was occupied by Germany. And he didn't really, he was under pressure to paint what they wanted to paint to promote war and stuff like that. He did paint uh, a title, a piece called Guernica, which was anti-war. And it actually, I thought it was quite compelling piece of work. Um, I'm not sure if, this is I don't have, I can't share the screen, but go ahead, Edith. It's massive. It's the size of the old wall. I've seen Guernica and it's his most famous painting. And it was yeah. the Spanish Civil War, the bombing of the town of Guernica in North yeah. Spain. Yeah. The very first bombing that ever happened was in the Spanish Civil War before the First and Second World War. And he's, it's near Barcelona, you know. Uh, well, it's near Malaga, um, on the north coast of Spain. Uh, the, the thing about it that fascinated me is, oh no, that's a different painting. Never mind, I'll keep quiet. Um, yeah. Um, he ended up losing his own credibility when he made ties to the Communist Party. Um, for a while, he was shunned and discredited because of that. There was nobody who wanted to pay attention to anything that he was doing. So he stopped painting for a while, and it was during those years that he wrote books of poetry, and he wrote two plays, one called The Desire Caught by the Tail, and the second one was The Four Little Girls. In 1944, after the war, with a new mistress who gave him two more children, he turned from painting to sculpture, and he bought a large studio where he could produce his large plaster figures. Um, working with his plaster, some of his works were actually commissioned to museums in the United States. Uh, so there's uh, Chicago and there's Philadelphia. And I don't know where else, but those were the ones that I could clarify for sure. But on top of commissions, he also donated piece to Chicago, a museum called the Chicago Picasso. At the age of 79, he married his second wife and she was only 27 years old. They had no children, but she stayed with him until he died. So Picasso rode the waves of controversy. He lived the life that he wanted to live. He reached past himself and he constantly pushed himself as an artist. He constantly pushed the art world to be more than it was. And he pushed society to do what, what he could to cry out against injustice. And this attitude has earned him as a spot as the father of modern art. Interesting. Thanks, Jody. You're welcome. Thank you. I Edith. thought that was only going to take five or 10 minutes. I was at it for a while. Well done. Edith, <laughs> Edith did you have paintings, photos of paintings you were going to show? I didn't get any to put on a screenshot, no. No, Edith has oh, something. Edith has a book. A bit. Shall I show you them here? Just hold them up if you can. Can you see that? Yes. That's the first Picasso I ever met. It was when I was at school and it was on the wall in our dining hall. Mm, wow. wow. And it, uh, this is black and white, but it's obviously in color. And it um, dates from 1901. Can you believe wow. it's old? Wow. It's so modern, isn't it? Mm -hmm. And the child with a dove is what it's called. 
Isn't that adorable? Yeah. I think that's wow. beautiful. And then I've got some of one of the wives you talked about in the, the ballerina, the ballet russe in Paris. Uh, this is one of, I think this is a blue period. That's her. Wow. That, again, a beautiful painting, isn't it? Oh, yes. Gorgeous. Yeah. Mixed media, line and wash, isn't it? And the child that he had with her was called Paolo. And here he is. That's Aww. Paolo Picasso. <laughs> I think that's rather gorgeous as well. And then in 1929, he was doing things like this. That's called the wow. acrobat. And it doesn't matter which way you hold it, it works. And so it gives a feeling of action and rotating somersaults. <laughs> That's um, 1920, oh, it's 1930 painted that. And then um, I've got several pictures of women, uh, as, uh, as you said, he was uh, interested in women. Uh, this one is cr a woman crying, cubism, and it's about the Spanish Civil War. It's a, um, you know, sad picture from a Spanish woman, I think. And I've got a, one here of a woman with her arms raised. That's much more uh, recent. Oh no, 1936 when he was in Paris. And a woman with a green scarf. Date on that one is 1938, that's the year I was born. <laughs> mm. And finally, there's a picture here of a much more recent work. In his last few years, he did ceramics. He was attached to a ceramic factory and um, he, they gave him free run really to make lots and lots of plates and uh, cups and you know vases. And this one is, is, shows a mythical creature. You mentioned mythical creatures. Jody, and this is a fawn with some, some human, and it's got the um, way he does the eyes. You can see there's a profile and a full face on there, mm -hmm. and a pair of horns, <laughs> which says something, I think. So I just picked these out. They're from exhibitions I've been to. I've been to three Picasso exhibitions in the last few years. Wow. One in Malaga, where he was born, in Spain. Uh, one in... Um, Barcelona, where he lived a lot for many years. Um, this is the catalogue from the Malaga exhibition. I don't know if you can see it. So. And uh, then I've got this big book, which I bought as an exhibition, a Picasso exhibition in uh, Brittany, France. Uh, this was one organized by the owners of one of the big supermarkets in France. So, so there's a um, foundation art and they sponsor artistic events. And I bought this big volume. And I think this is his last wife, the one you spoke about that he that lived with him till he died. Yeah. Jacqueline, is she called? Yes, Jacqueline. And yes, I believe in, her name is Jacqueline. Uh, they lived in the south of France near Cannes. And uh, that's where he did the pottery a bit. But there's the, quite... I think it's a really interesting life, don't you? That thanks for what you did. I really learned a lot from what you did. Thank I was actually I, I looked at his works before and I knew that they were rough and raw and I never understood why yeah. he was doing it. And I was actually very fascinated with his cry for justice. Mm. That all of his work was trying, like he was exposing injustice with yeah. everything that he was doing. He was calling out the artist for saying, you're hiding it, you're doing it wrong. He was calling out society for saying, you're not taking care of these people. Mm. And he was willing to take the flack to hear, to be heard, you know? Mm. Kind of an unstoppable mindset. And just, and it surprised surprising. me. It surprised me. To say very that- interesting. He, yeah, anyway, thank you. <laughs> yes, thank you for your time. Well, you're welcome. So do we want to do this again next week? Somebody take an artist and 
do some research? It, it's very interesting, isn't it? You learn it a lot. I've learned a lot today. I'm, yeah. I'm really grateful. <laughs> Edith, would you like to pick an artist and do some research? Well, which one? You pick the artist and I'll do the research. <laughs> well, What's actually, this? would you be interested in... Uh some of the modern or the the oh my gosh i lost the period manet and monet that period the uh impressionism, impressionism yes um which one would you like <laughs> well manet actually influenced picasso as well they all do Matisse yeah. and uh, yeah and even russo who uh, it was called the douanier yeah um yeah what about uh, the one with the garden is it Manet's garden that's Monet, Monet. yeah no Giverny Giverny yes yeah, yeah. Um, which is still open you can go there you can you can paint there you can take a residency there if you've got the money for it to get into France first they've only just opened the borders this week <laughs> well yes yeah, so okay non-covid times it was something that was available <laughs> So I didn't know that it was still kept. Yes, it's been restored. It's for, I think it's uh, uh, not a quite original, you know. But the house is there, isn't it? Mm -hmm. um, it's fairly near where I used to live, but I have never been. Never been okay. at all. Never went. My well, son. You'll have to go for there. all of us and take pictures. Yeah, but not. The, I've got to get across the channel first. I've not been for a year. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So well, you're next, okay, so you're next week then, Edith. I am, am I? I should, <laughs> choose, I should choose Gorgon. It's interesting, isn't it? Sure, he's do a, that. Yeah. He's a naughty one. <laughs> I think they all were. <laughs> Artists, yeah. Okay, Paul Gorgon, because he painted in Brittany where I used to live. Yeah. Oh, excellent. Good. We'll do that. We'll do a post that that's what is uh, next week. And maybe we'll get more people interested. Perhaps. <laughs> I should be so, from in. Okay. Ten, only a quarter of an hour, though. <laughs> I really didn't expect that this was going to take as long as it did. So. No, but it was great. You did well, so well. Yes. Very, very nice. nice. And we didn't, we had asked if anybody had any questions. That was one of the other things that we wanted to bring into the meet and greet. And nobody had questions unless one of you ladies do. I have a question about the brush of thickener. Does anyone use that? I have used it. Um, I know Sally Taylor in her more recent landscape course shows using it. Let me grab it. It comes in a little packet. I've had this for, oh my gosh, several years. And you, you <laughs> Such a, such a tiny bit. And I don't know if you can see how thick this is. And this is kind of thinned down since I've had it for so long. Um, I don't use it very often, but once in a while I'll use it. And it just kind of makes it more um, like a creamier substance and gives not really texture on a painting because it kind of dries very thin. But um, it gives a little bit of texture. So what do you do? Mix the crystals into that and paint water. with it or? I mixed it with water and it thickens up. When right, but, I, but to use it with brush oak, do you take a little bit out and mix the brush oak crystals mm -hmm. into it or? You can lay it down first and then let it dry and paint over the top. You can, I've mixed brush oak in, you know, take a little bit out and mix it, the brush oak in with it. So is it like the equivalent of a texture gel if it was acrylic? No. It has more of that feel. I don't think it Yeah, is. I painted this with it 
Okay. Um, but I put the, and this was just fussing because I hadn't used it at all. Um, I, I put it in a little wells like this and added the crystals to it. Okay. Um, I'm just, I'm not, and it just, it dries very flat. It doesn't yeah. have any feel that you would know that it was, had a texture to it. Yeah. Um, but it has more of a gel look. Yeah, I'm trying to think it's not really more like an acrylic because it's clear where acrylics are um, more opaque. It's kind of, um, you can see how thick it is. Mm. So, so is it like really a loose to gelatin? Slow down the spread on the paper? Is it to yeah. kind of control it? Is that why they made it? Well, you really, as long as you don't get brush all wet, you can control it. Right. But you know, so I mean, if you want to work within a contained area, you just leave the rest of it dry. But oh, where's my brush? Oh. So this is lime green. This is one of my I'm going to paint every day flowers that didn't mm. turn out. Why didn't it turn out? What's wrong with that? That's good to me. <laughs> turn it, you turn just... it around. Ain't nothing wrong with that, girlfriend. Yuck. Nothing's wrong with that. Yeah. It just must not match your. You just don't like it because you don't like it, but there's nothing wrong with it. Right. Oh, well. Sorry. I'm well, gonna I that. sprinkled a little bit of brush out <laughs> in. And, you know, just trying to mix it. It doesn't mix like mixing with water. Can you see the, you know, can you see where it still has? It's, so you, it's easy to control, in fact, isn't it? Kind of. Yeah. But now, yes. if you can, I don't, you can't really look at it, but there's brush strokes in this. But Anna, am I correct that when it dries, it dries flat. It doesn't have those brush strokes really in it. Well, I, I've only used it really once, um, and, and I can't tell you. I just was wondering how people um, were using it, because I, I bought a container about, it's, mine's a round container, and it would last all of us hundreds of years. <laughs> if all four of us shared it, we would have it for hundreds of years. I mean, you use very little, and I... I made like two and a half cups worth. It's in the, you store it in the refrigerator. Oh, I don't store, I don't store mine in the refrigerator. <laughs> yeah, that's what I, I read. I mean, I don't, I don't know. I haven't, I'm not sure I like it. I haven't found a use for it yet. What this says on here, and of course this is all in grams, sprinkle 20 grams into 60 millimeter or 600 millimeter water. Stir briskly to avoid lumps. Leave for 24 hours to dissolve completely. Thin if necessary. Dampen paper to use. Helps keep paste uh, workable for longer. So, yeah, I don't know. I'm not sold on it. <laughs> well, I was, I think I saw somebody who was using it when they were doing birch trees, and I think it helped the brush show you know, move across better in a birch tree. I don't, I just was wondering if any of you had used it and how successful you were with it and how you used it. You can see where it stains the paper where I sprinkled, it went through the thickener and you can see the spots mm. that they don't, you know, you can't mix them now. Mm. They, well, you, know. you should experiment, Anna, with the different thicknesses. I mean, now that you know the ratio, like you know the rule, yeah. you can break it, right? Right, totally. So totally. See if you can make it thicker and get some texture on there that you enjoy and write down. Oh, that would be a ratio. cool idea. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. I will. I will try and do something before next week to show you what I've okay. come up with. And I'll try and get, but I can't go in shops yet. Hmm. I don't actually own any of the 
paste. So I will just wait for your experiments to let me know what well, happens. Anybody wants any, I'll send you a little bit because it's like, I have a plenty. <laughs> Well, yeah, I'm not yeah. sure how a white powder coming through the mail system would actually oh um, God, <laughs> yeah. so but it reminds me of um it's gritty, it almost like is a sand texture. It's not real fine. So is it like wallpaper paste? Okay. Yeah, yeah. But it's not sticky. Uh -uh. Like a wallpaper paste. Oh, no, no, no. Because you sprinkle it in water, don't you? And it goes jelly one side. Yeah. Yeah, it goes jelly and it actually was lumpy and I put it in the refrigerator overnight and it just had all dissolved, just totally mm -hmm. dissolved. Yeah. The so, first, yeah. Uh, Same with me. The first time I mixed it, it just, it was glumps. Like, that's the only way I can explain it. It's, I don't know. It's very odd stuff. Now it's dried on my fingers and it's not sticky. Mm -hmm. So I don't know. Yeah. I don't know. I just thought I'd ask. Yeah. Well, I'm glad see. you did. Yeah. So, so what's yeah. everybody else? Edith, what are you working on? Uh, well, I've been a bit abstract the last couple of days. I've been doing some paintings with my credit card, you know? Mm -hmm. Uh, bankers well it's off the off one of the YouTubes and um I think I've have been having a black period as you might say <laughs> because I've used a lot of paints gray and tried to do townscapes you know mm. scraping rather than anything else but uh, uh, there's only one that's worth looking at really and the yeah. others are all it's experimental put it like that <laughs> hey that's fun yeah, you have to do new things sometimes, don't you? Yeah. And I've, I've been, um, what else have I done? Nothing much. I've done one painting that was on the subject of water. Um, we're given that by the art group. They give us a subject now and then. And I did a picture of um, an area of Britain called the Norfolk Broads. Have you heard of those? They're, uh, it's all lakes and marshes and uh, I had a nice picture. I, I've done quite a nice sort of landscape, water landscape, you know. But that's all I've done, not a lot. What medium? Oh, watercolour. I do watercolour. That's my main medium. I don't do anything else. I used to do pastels at one time, but um, no watercolour and, and ink sometimes, and of course, brush up. <laughs> yeah. I don't do oils and I don't do acrylic. I just love it though. I'm a real, you know, it's one of the things that just, well, as I keep saying, it keep, keeps me going through this wretched lockdown. Yeah. yeah. I don't know how people who aren't artists cope. Well, they, they do a lot of new things, things, don't they? They're people... getting puppies and they're. Oh, yeah, there's that too. I tried to buy some white wool because my cleaner's expecting a baby and. Um, there's no white baby wool to be had on the internet at all. Couldn't find it. There's everybody's knitting. <laughs> yeah. Oh, I've had to choose blue. It's a boy, so that's all right. <laughs> well, that's good. Yeah. yeah. Oh. And I know Jody's framing and getting ready for her show, so. Yeah, I'll be glad when it's up because <laughs> well the hardest part is I paint something and I love it and I put it in the basement and it sits there for two years and then when I go to hang it I don't love it anymore because I've grown and developed so much and it's like oh my gosh nobody wants to see this so I'm just conflicted about what pieces to choose and put in there and I just want to paint all new every time a show comes up <laughs> not that I have them all the time that sounds pretentious but um, they're coming my way and um, yeah it's just been exciting but also stressful to try to pick the pieces to go in there and get them ready yeah I, terrible not... problem to have yeah right <laughs> such a problem yeah. <laughs> oh. and Anna's in Texas and you're what are you up to well I I paint all across the board but I only do watercolor and brush show 
and uh, last night I whipped this up before going to bed. Nothing, nothing that. fancy. <laughs> nothing very fancy. Cute. Just I thought I would try to do the flower thing. I recently um, bought a book on painting animals, and so with multicolor. So I, Ooh. I did this friend's dog, and then I, I've. I have to work on one of them, but I've done a, I don't know where my grand dog is. Oh, here. This is my grand dog. So. Um, very cool. Are those that is very fun. No, these are watercolor. Okay. Um, these are watercolor. I, I'm thinking about doing one with Brescia to see what it's like. The, uh, you know, Brescia dries so fast. And once it's dry, it's so permanent. You cannot. <laughs> get it to do what you want it to do but maybe if I put that thickener down it would give it more flow I will um I paint a lot of postcard size um, and mail out postcards if anybody wants a postcard just let me know your address I can even mail across the the water um, um I uh so I I haven't painted like the whole thing and let it dry and see I'll do a couple different things with the thickener and try it out and see what happens okay. um so yeah it's it's fun um easter's coming so i started painting on eggs um that's been an interesting little endeavor little plastic eggs or real eggs well these are no they're not real these are um i don't know i put a i put a like a um what is that stuff called Oh, it's right here. I put a, an absorbent ground on okay. for watercolor. And then I painted that on here. And um, they're they're hollow. They're very lightweight. You know, they're and uh, and then I've started painting on them. Mm, that's so cool. Mm. And uh, I use this with the gel. Oh, this these are two of the gel, and then this one. I think was not gel. Maybe this side was gel. Um, and I just, it was just something fun. Thought I'd try it. We'll see. How fun. I'm, I'm gonna, have you painted on wood? Um, I have, I got a hold of an old palette and I want to paint on wood. Has anybody painted on wood? I with have, but not with watercolor. Just, okay. Well, I have some other clear ground to put to get on it and uh, I'm going to try and paint. I'll let you know how it goes. Fun. Yeah. Yeah. That's fun. Um, and when have you painted on cloth with brush show? Has anybody done cloth? Um, we have a couple artists that do, but the big question comes into whether it's permanent, which it will wash out eventually. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So I'll have to I like experimenting, so who knows? So, yeah. We're only well, this has been by the things we can't think of. Exactly, and it's only paper. You know, when I start out, it's like, ah, it's like it's only paper. You can redo it; it doesn't matter. It's you know, you ruin it, you ruin it. When I talk to my sister and I'm painting, and I'm like, oh, I just ruined it. She's like, yeah, yeah, okay. In a few minutes, you'll tell me how much you love it. So don't worry. <laughs> And you can so, always turn the paper over. Yeah. Yeah. There's yeah. always two sides. So. And if you ruin both sides, there's always collage. You can cut it up yeah. and turn it into something. Else. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. Or so. there's file 13 that sits right next to me. There's that. Uh -huh. <laughs> yep. Every so often, away it goes. So, but this has been lovely, ladies. I'm going to run and, uh, we will see you next week. See you next week. Yes. Enjoy. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, well, we, and we'll see you next week with your um, art history. Or go down. Yeah, I'm going to save this and post it. I have to figure out how to do it, but where I'm going to post it and how. So we have these all saved and we can, you know, people can go back and watch. I think it's good information. It is. Yeah. You set a very high standard today. <laughs> yeah, Jody did a great job. Thank you, Jody. Well, thank you. I really enjoyed doing it. I'll do it again later. I just don't want to do them all.
So oh, come on. <laughs> <laughs> Go on, I'll have a turn. With it, you know, yeah. <laughs> Well, we'll right. just enjoy whatever you come up with. and I'll try and get my laptop working for next week and try and get all of you on at once. <laughs> all right. So, I'll anything, try bye and bye. Do, yeah, I'll try and do some research and see on a phone, but it may be because your screen is so small, you can only yeah. see the speaker. Uh, but my, my laptop's misbehaving badly, but I'm going to get it sorted. I don't mm -hmm. use it anymore. I always use the phone. Yeah. Phone's wonderful. Okay, I'm I'm off now. Okay, enjoy the rest of your day. Bye. Bye. Thank you. See you next week. Bye.